Hello, and welcome back to another Monster Monday, a series where I draw a creature from D&D, and I talk about its lore and its history, and what it's like to fight in-game as well. These videos are based on your suggestions, which you kindly leave for me down in the comment section below. So if you have a monster that you'd like to see me draw, please make sure to leave your suggestion down there. And today's suggestion was first made by Sydney Brown, and I am immensely thankful that they have, because I have been bursting to draw this monster. Now, Sydney was the first person to suggest trolls, the topic of today's discussion, but all of your suggestions go on a to-draw list of mine, which I then hand over to my patrons over on Patreon, who get the chance to vote on which monsters they'd like to see me draw in what order. And that's for backers and supporters at any level whatsoever. So if you'd like the chance to have more control over the videos that you see from me, and you'd like to help support the channel, and send me a tip for making these videos for you. And I urge you to head over to my Patreon page so you can get the chance to vote on this Monster Monday order. But if not, if that's not something you can afford or not something that you want to do, please do not worry. Although I absolutely adore the sort of personal interaction that I get with my patrons, becoming a patron is not something you're comfortable with. I hope you just enjoy the video anyway. So let's get started with today's video, shall we? Now, I don't think I did a particularly good job masking my excitement here because trolls are some of the absolutely most brilliant creatures to use as a DM, in my opinion. To look at them, on the face of them, they might just appear like more sort of green-skinned fodder for your adventurers to turn into mulch like goblins and orcs. But trolls have a near limitless potential for variety in combat and also for world building. Trolls joined D&D during its inception, getting published in 1974's White Box set, and were described as, quote, thin and rubbery, loathsome creatures, able to regenerate. But this appearance, as well as their regenerative properties, is a far cry from their historical and folklore origins. They can trace their origins to Norse and Scandinavian folktales, where they're usually depicted and described as massive, dim-witted, grotesque humanoids with enormous noses, thick matted hair, like the crusty, greasy mane of that one guy you stood behind at that music festival that one time. Yeah, you remember the guy. Often they have thin, drooping tails with a tuft of hair at the end. Not unlike a lion's tail, I guess. They tend to have slumped back posture. But simultaneously, the tales of these creatures are so old and so varied that trolls are just as often described as being just like large humans almost, with pretty much none of the features that I've just listed. Fairly uniformly though, they tend to dwell in caves deep within mountains, either alone or in small nuclear family groups, and are generally said to turn to stone when exposed to sunlight, and the results of which are believed to be many of the ancient rocky outcrops and other noticeable, ancient, hard-to-describe, hard-to-explain, and eye-catching stone landmarks that litter Sweden, Finland, and other formerly Norse areas. Famously, this turning to stone was used as a plot device in The Hobbit, where Bilbo and his band of dwarf teammates were captured by a cluster of trolls intending to eat them. But using their superior wits, Bilbo and co duped the trolls into arguing about the best way to cook the group until the sun rose and these trolls instead turned to stone. Now, in addition to their natural vulnerability to sunlight in Norse mythology, later Scandinavian stories also depicted them as having a pathological fear of thunder, lightning, and of the ringing of church bells. The former being due to their fear of their old adversary, Thor, the Thunder God, and the latter being because of their ungodly and unchristian nature, a concept which became popular when Christianity became widespread in the region. The word troll meant something like spirit, fiend, demon, giant, and also, I was surprised to read, werewolf, which I suppose trolls now owe to their hairy appearance. Although they were generally categorised into two types, the larger Jotun and the smaller Huldrafolk, or Hidden Folk. The D&D version was largely inspired by a story published in 1961 called Three Hearts and Three Lions, written by science fiction author Paul Anderson. I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly. It's Paul spelt P-O-U-L. Anyway. It's a story which seems to have enormously influenced Pan's Labyrinth, and features a Danish engineer called Holger Carlsen, 
who, while fighting the Nazis in World War II, is shot, which, rather than killing him, catapults him into a parallel fantasy reality and a subsequent epic D&D style adventure to return home, which results eventually in a battle with the aforementioned regenerating troll. Now, trolls in D&D are large, chaotic, evil giants who operate on the same level of the giant Ordning as ogres, that level being the absolute bottom. But unlike ogres, trolls could not care less about their position in the Ordning, or, well, pretty much anything else really. They often work as mercenaries for orcs, hags, goblin hosts, other giants, or anyone happy to pay them in food or valuables. But similarly, their allegiances and packs mean pretty much next to nothing to them, no matter how powerful or intimidating their employers are. This is likely due to their frankly insane regeneration abilities. No matter how someone intends to punish a troll for not honouring a deal or terms of their employment, no matter how this person may choose to reprimand a disobedient troll, they can be pretty confident that they're almost indestructible and with their enormous lifespans granted to them by their giant bloodline, it kind of means that consequence is not something that actually burdens a troll's mind at all. In addition, they have a staggeringly high pain threshold. I'll talk a little bit more about this later on, but if a troll were to lose a limb, for example, it might sting a little bit, but it's not going to be anything like the kind of suffering and injury, the kind of agony that a human might experience. They might feel the sharp tang of perhaps a bee sting, or maybe at worst a snake bite, but it wouldn't cause them to pass out or anything. In game, their regeneration takes many forms and grants them some really strange features. Just like I mentioned in my Oni video last week, trolls passively regenerate 10 HP at the start of their turn, so it's going to take some pretty serious and pretty consistent damage to kill a troll, but on top of that, trolls can only actually be killed if they start their turn with 0 HP and they don't regenerate, which seems like a paradox. But this feat can be achieved, but only through the application of fire or acid to a troll to mitigate its regeneration process, something that's going to eat away their tissue or cauterize their wounds as quickly or quicker than they might regenerate them. This is a reference to Paul Anderson's troll, who is similarly vulnerable to fire, but also possibly to the trial of Hercules or Heracles, whichever version is your preference, where he had to fight the Hydra, who would regrow three heads for each one that was removed, unless the stump of its neck was cauterized with fire. Now a troll's regeneration is so potent that their thick, viscous green blood is often used as the primary ingredient in potions of healing, which can be harvested from the severed limbs of this beast, which still claw an attack of their own will and accord long after severed from a troll's body. It's even plausible that a troll might be able to clone itself by removing a limb and preserving it and caring for it for long enough to grow a juvenile version of itself from the reforming appendage. Limb removal is a huge part of the fun of using trolls as a DM. They have a variant or optional rule called Loathsome Limbs, which mentions that whenever a troll takes at least 15 slashing damage in a single attack, a d20 is rolled, and the result corresponds to a chart that the DM has access to, which may result in several pieces of the troll being hacked off of its body, requiring reattachment, or a short rest to regrow, missing appendage, or appendages. But as I've just mentioned, once removed, these limbs act of their own free will, and this table gives DMs the stats for these missing appendages, which lash out on their own, including stats and advice if a troll's head is removed. Spoilers, the head tries to tell the body what to do until it lumbers over and reattaches the troll's head, which seems kind of hard to do, seeing as the body would not have any sense organs to actually hear what the head is shouting at it. But Anyway, it seems comical enough, and this regeneration and adaptiveness actually grants this challenge rating 5 monster a whole host of other abilities and features, other variations of trollhood, some of which have been published in Morden Kanan's Tome of Foes as alternative versions of the troll. The thinking goes that depending on what a troll eats and the circumstances of their numerous deaths, trolls can grow, mutate and adapt to a host of different and disturbing circumstances which alters them in a variety of different ways. 
trolls that are so starved or maybe curious for new types of meals will sometimes resort to cannibalism and will result in the formation of the 30 odd foot tall, multi limbed, multi headed, challenge rating 13 dire troll, which looks like a hideous sort of flesh golem giant troll mixture. Those trolls left in squalid and disease ridden hovels. Perhaps those that make friends with Otiugs and choose to live with them are warped into the putrid rot troll, a creature constantly in agony, producing a blighted mist of disease and decay as it constantly heals and survives through its own injuries. Those dwelling too close to the lairs of mind flayers or slain by psychic powers may return as the incorporeal spirit trolls and trolls who survive doses of poison may return as the bloated venom troll who can spray toxic sludge at their opponents. And that's just to name a few. Trolls famously take on the appearance of their environment, creating things like rock trolls with stony, wart-like growths all over their shoulders, arms and back. River trolls or swamp trolls might appear more crocodilian in nature, Forest trolls may grow great branches from the tops of their heads like horns, and frost trolls may appear as ghostly white, camouflaging themselves in their snowy domains. But this got me thinking about some world building for trolls. As many of you know, I am an absolutely massive, massive World of Warcraft fan, a game which was influenced by Dungeons and Dragons. And in this game, one of the oldest races to inhabit this planet of Azeroth, one of the playable creatures, is a regenerating, long-limbed, gangly, slumped-over troll. Trolls are one of the progenitor races on Azeroth, and the ease of it they take to environmental changes resulted in them eventually evolving into elves. All elves in World of Warcraft owe their heritage to trolls, and it made me wonder if there's anything similar in Dungeons and Dragons. As I mentioned in my Oni video, we know that it's very likely that ogres in general came about through the affair of Othai, the mother of all giant kind, the wife of the Allfather, having an affair with a brutal god of destruction, causing ogres which are still part of giant kind. And it made me wonder if perhaps Corallon and Othai, or Corallon and the Allfather, maybe also had an affair resulting in troll kind producing these giants. Corallon is the father or mother of the elves, an unintentioned side effect of them bleeding on the ground, their divine blood causing elves to sprout from the earth. And I'm sure Corallon will get their own video, but the long and short of Corallon is that they are a fluidly gendered, fluidly everything, essentially a god of chaos, whose form depends on their mood, but also on what they need to accomplish and their environment. The Eladrin, creatures which are supposed to be incredibly similar to Corallon, take on the form of the elements and of their environment entirely, and this adaptiveness, as well as the regenerative properties of something which shifts so regularly, makes me think that perhaps the fusion of this chaotic, adaptable god and one who is responsible for giant kind may have produced something like trolls, and that perhaps over refinement over the many generations, trolls may have become elves, perhaps. It's definitely something that I'm going to sprinkle into my own world building in future. I wonder if they did the same in your mythology. Make sure to let me know if trolls played a greater part in your world building, if they have any connection to elves at all, or if they're their own standalone species. For now, it'll just be a fanciful thought of mine. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed today's video, guys. I absolutely loved it. I love researching this one. I love drawing this one. This was really, really great fun for me. So I hope you enjoyed it as well. If you did, please make sure to leave it a like down below, a little thumbs up, perhaps favorite this video, and share it with some of the communities that you're a part of. We really need your help to grow this channel. So thank you very much if you choose to do that. Otherwise, if you really love this drawing and you'd like a copy for yourself, if you'd like to support the channel in a very, very personal way and help me make these videos every single week, if you'd like to vote on which monsters I do next, get access to exclusive live streams or one-on-one -on -one chats with me, then I'd urge you to head over to my Patreon page, where backers at every level get a chance to vote on which creatures I draw next. But if not, I'm glad you joined me today anyway. And until next time, try not to guzzle too many potions of healing in case you end up with a bit too much troll in your stomach. You don't want one of those things regenerating from the inside out, so always think about what you're drinking. 
and happy monster hunting. Mm-hmm.